if everyone could start a business and start marketing and grow it and it was automatic, everyone would do it. And so I think to be a little bit comfortable with trying different things and see what it works and then ramp up that activity, but you really can't do anything unless you define who you're trying to talk to first. You're listening to The Successful Bookkeeper with your host, Michael Palmer. Listen each week as inspiring guests share their secrets of success to help you increase your confidence, work smarter, and build a business you love. This episode of The Successful Bookkeeper is brought to you by purebookkeeping.com, the proven system to grow your bookkeeping business. Welcome back to the Successful Bookkeeper Podcast. I am your host, Michael Palmer, and today's show is going to be a very good one. Our guest is a widely respected and creative industry leader with more than 25 years of experience at brands such as Calvin Klein, Seventeen, and the New York Times Digital. As a co-founder of Wild Coffee Marketing, she focuses on transforming businesses through a diverse set of disciplines and tailor-made teams. Amy Anderson, Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me, Michael. I'm super excited to be here. It's great to have you. And I'm, I'm looking forward to this conversation. I love marketing. And I know our many of our listeners love marketing and love attracting great clients into their business. So I think it's going to be an exciting conversation. But before we get into all of that, please tell us about you and your career journey leading up to this point. Sure. Well, you know, when you mentioned 25 years in my bio, it's hard to realize I'm now, I think I'm, I'm pushing 30. Um, but I've spent the majority of my career on client side marketing, um, which means that I was in in in-house marketing departments at some pretty big companies, uh, primarily media. So started at 17 magazine and I worked with the New York times, as you mentioned, um, and then several dot coms. And I was really comfortable in corporate environments. I uh, knew how to function well. I felt like the planning and infrastructure was all there for me. Um, I could really sell my ideas and be innovative. Um, And I was comfortable and loved it. And then my life changed um, when I had two small boys and I got divorced and I needed to navigate sort of my career and my life in a way that could um, support my boys. And so I decided to start consulting. Because at that point in my career, I had so many years under my belt that I probably would have been a VP of marketing or a CMO at a large company, which is all I knew how to do, um, but really wanted to be available and flexible for these boys and started my own marketing consulting business with just me. Um, And I was doing social media and some strategy and some growth strategies for some smaller firms. But then I um, rejoined with my former boss, who's now my business partner, and we started Wild Coffee about five years ago. And what we really tried to do was translate our in-house marketing experience, because we weren't necessarily from the agency side of marketing, um, and outsource marketing for larger companies. So now we have uh, 15, maybe 17 as of today, employees in seven different states. And we run outsourced marketing teams built on strategy for brands such as Stretch Zone, Carolina Skiff Boats, Sea Chaser Boats, um, financial services companies, um, and have really tried to transform the model where companies can outsource all of their marketing folks and not have to have and manage in-house teams. Very cool. Very cool. And quite a, quite a journey. Uh, I mean, f- going through divorce, having young kids, and then starting a, a business that uh, I always love to hear, like for you, what, what was the, the biggest hurdle along that journey? Well, I had been in sales before. I I have an outgoing personality. And I think in my 20s in New York, and then I was in Boston, I would meet people along my career journey who thought I should be a salesperson. And I had failed at that. I wasn't comfortable talking about budgets. I wasn't comfortable selling. And so I think when you start your own business, right, whether it's bookkeeping or marketing or you're doing legal, legal consulting, you can be very good at what you do. 
But if you're not always selling, you don't have a business. And so it was that sales part that I had to really overcome and, and that idea that I wasn't good at it, that the idea that I wasn't a good negotiator or closer. Um, and then when it came down to it, um, I realized in marketing and in most of our job roles, we're always selling. Whether you're selling the numbers, you're selling, you know, the way you want to structure financial reporting, you're selling marketing ideas, you're selling a product, we're all selling all the time. And so when I became comfortable with that and knew I had to be doing it all the time in order to grow, I was able to get a lot more comfortable with it. Mm. Very cool. Very cool. And I, I think we'll, we'll jump into that a little further uh, in the conversation because sales, I mean, marketing that's that's what you do. I'd love to tackle that. And you know, our listener, our small business owners, working to grow their business, you've done that yourself. What is it that they're doing wrong when it comes to marketing? I think people will engage in tactics without really having a plan. And everything that we do for our clients, we will not start any engagement unless we have built the foundation. And so whether you're a large company or a small business, I think you really need to identify your target audience. If you don't know what market you're in and who your ideal client is, then how can you even begin marketing, right? So really looking at who you're trying to reach, where they are, and then building a plan around that. And then to be, I don't want to say okay with failing, but okay with testing right? Because you can't, if everyone could start a business and start marketing and grow it and it was automatic, everyone would do it. And so I think to be a little bit comfortable with trying different things and see what it works and then ramp up that activity, which you really can't do anything unless you define who you're trying to talk to first. We'll get back to the interview right after this word from our sponsor. Do you ever feel overwhelmed with your bookkeeping business? Are there just too many things swirling around in your head without a way to organize them all? Introducing Pure Workflow. It's a simple, easy to use workflow practice management solution, which will help you manage your clients, deadlines, workflow, and team with ease. Forget about all the struggling to keep everything organized. With Pure Workflow, you can focus on what's really important, your clients. Its client management software gives you one central place to manage all of your client relationships and communications. Plus, Pure Workflow has a flexible reporting ability that will allow you to manage your team and monitor productivity and business results. It offers everything you need to hit your deadlines, manage your to-dos, and stay in control. Unlike other workflow softwares in the bookkeeping industry, Pure Workflow is built exclusively for bookkeeping firms and comes complete with all the templates, training, and documentation for best practice bookkeeping, so you can run your business like a world-class firm. So get your precious time back, reduce overwhelm, and get organized with Pure Workflow. Check out pureworkflow.com for more information. That's pureworkflow.com. Thank you for hearing from our sponsor. Now let's get back to the interview. Hmm. So when it comes to planning, like that's critical piece. What, what is, I mean, I I think a lot of the times our listener maybe don't even know where to begin to, to build a plan. What would be a, what would be a way to overcome that particular mistake, which is not even having a plan to where they want to go? Well, I think, you know, in our world, we have this, what we call a peso model, which is sort of paid, earned, shared, and owned media. I think small business owners really need to look at their owned media first, right? And there are a couple places with that. You know, what's surprising, SCORE, which is a nonprofit, um, small business oriented organization, has said 51% of small business owners or consultants don't have a website. And so I think to really look at your own content, what you're saying about yourself, where can people find you? And that's how you sort of define who you are, what you offer. If someone's looking as 97% of people look for goods and services and companies online, especially locally, if they'd like someone in their own area, that your own content with your website needs to be in order. And also what can go with that is a Google My Business listing. 
for small businesses to set that up and have that link back to your website. There, people can give you reviews. Um, you can put your photo there. So I think sort of claiming your stake in your real estate on the internet is a really, really important place to start. And from there, you have to really look at, you know, are you a niche player? And do you specialize in something or are you trying to go really broad, right? Because you can't be all things to all people all the time. So if you have a couple of verticals that you specialize or products, are they there? And is that speaking to your ideal target customer? But to really focus on sort of your LinkedIn profile, your Google My Business listing, and your website as a place to start. Mm-hmm. That's great. I mean, that that's the beginning of a plan. Like it's, we've, if those aren't, handled or optimized, uh, kind of skipping over some really important steps. Yes. And I think it's really easy now in today's environment to, you know, once you have your foundation built and you have your website and your presence there, um, there's a lot that you can do to be out there that's cost effective, right? If you're publishing articles on LinkedIn or on your website and linking back to them, right? So how much are you engaging in social media? Email, if you have a current client base, a current customer base, that, that's a captive audience that's much more efficient to reach again and to stay top of mind of them with newsletters, thoughts, and ideas that you can send out you know, with very simple sort of MailChimp applications that way. Um, and it's also low touch, low contact marketing, you know, and, and for small business owners or bookkeepers that have to be out and sort of networking in that environment, you know, low contact is often better for them um, just to stay top of mind because we've built Wild Coffee we've um, based on referrals over the last five years. Um, we haven't done a lot of marketing ourselves, although we do it for clients. We do a lot of social media. But, um, you know, it's a way that newsletters and, and being present on social is a way to stay top of mind among our current clients um, and even people we haven't met yet. Very interesting. So how... I'd love to hear how your referral journey went, because I, I would say that the clients you're working with for marketing, you know, a lot of them are very different business models than, than what you have. And I would say your business model is very, very, not similar to a bookkeeping services firm, right? And so you've really nailed it with referral business. What's been your secret there? Well, I think we've done good work. <laughs> so that's, that's, so that's the first, it's, it's right? great work. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So you're more prone uh, to be referred. Um, and, you know, it's interesting because when we first started and we had smaller clients, they maybe weren't our ideal clients in all ways. And so those maybe not quite ideal clients would refer others that were sort of similar to them. And so I think it's, and we used to, it's okay to ask. And the way we would position it is to say, you know, we've built some capacity into the firm and we're looking at acquiring some new clients. If you have anyone you work with in the business that you think could benefit from working with us, you know, we'd be very open to that. And I always positioned it from a place of we have capacity because the first thing that your current clients think about with respect to referring you is, is this going to impact what this firm or this person is doing for me? It's so true. Yes, because they're saying, well, wait, are they going to get too busy and they're not going to produce the same results for me? So it's always to let them know I've built capacity or I have room or, you know, we've hired new team members. So we have the space to do that and not to be afraid to ask. And that's why I love sort of the newsletter model and, um, and social because you can still put your thought leadership out there, you know, what you're seeing in the market, key studies of ways you've helped other businesses you know, and tell those stories so that you can stay top of mind so that when their colleagues are there networking and they're out there, um, they think of you first. So true. And I love, I love the way you've positioned that and worded it. I think it's probably the best I've ever heard is, you know, we built capacity and we're, you know, we're open to having other clients join us, but get it. And I think that Listener, you could, you know, stop the recording, go back, play that again, write that down and use that with your current and existing clients. That will be literally a very valuable tip from Amy. So thank you, Amy, for that. I love that script. But getting back to the bit about ideal clients, because I, I think we've talked about this a lot on the podcast, which is 
you know, birds of a feather flock together. And so mm-hmm. if you have really bad clients, they're going to refer really bad clients likely. I mean, if we're talking generalities and you said it yourself, if you have not quite ideal clients, those not quite ideal clients refer not quite ideal clients. How do you level up that? Or was there something you did to sort of break out of that? Because I think it happens a lot in this industry where you you kind of take whoever you can and then they're you end up with what you got and then it's not necessarily what you want. How do you break that that cycle? Oh, that's such a good question. Because in the beginning, we knew the clients that we had maybe were building blocks and we were learning and we were doing really good work so that we could take that work and go upstream so that we could build a bit of reputation. We could build a portfolio. We could build experience. And then we took that and we started to target. So rather than waiting for some referrals, we did start to ask our current clients. We did start to put ourselves out there a little bit more and we had a stronger story to tell. The other part is that maybe two or three summers ago, we decided to completely change our pricing structure. And that's risky. We knew what the industry average was. We knew that we were charging less than that because we were starting a business. But then when you have the experience and the volume of work and the client base that you have, that should give you both the confidence and the ability maybe with some extra cash flow (laughs) to not take on less than ideal clients, wait that out and try to go upstream and really look at what types of businesses, what types of clients that you know want and you see the value in what you do, have the ability and the desire to pay for your services. Um, So then we made that next jump. And I think we're going through a third right now where, you know, we are in this sort of renaissance of expanding our services, hiring new people and and going into other categories. But these are categories, Michael, that we thought about. Mm -hmm. You know, franchise, quick service, restaurant companies, we do very good work for. So we've just really focused some time and energy, um, getting a few introductions, and that's starting to happen for us. Very interesting, very cool, and very exciting for our listener to mm-hmm. to be doing this. And I think that's a similar trajectory. It's like you start out and you go through these different phases, uh, but pricing is a big one and it's a big leap. If you get it right, it, it does leap you into a next a next phase and price yourself to the type of client you want to have uh, in a way. So I, I, love the, I love that advice. Now, you had mentioned as well the like the different types of marketing that you could attend. And like the, one of the things that our, our bookkeepers will do or door to door, like you said, reaching out, what's the, what's like our, our bookkeeper listeners are like bookkeeping business listeners are introverts more so. Uh, and so is there anything they can do that makes those things easier? Um, like you've kind of explained in your journey that that wasn't really your thing. And then you sort of figured it out. What advice can you give there? Well, I think, you know, when someone tends to be an introvert, it expends a lot of energy to do sort of networking and outreach in that way. Um, I will admit that, you know, I own and run a, a marketing firm that does social media for national brands, yet I rarely post myself personally. And now I have told myself that that that's perfectly acceptable. (laughs) (laughs) My personal life and my business life are two different things. And I have an amazing team that does it. But I think the key is to play to your strengths. And if you tend to be more introverted, are there low interaction marketing and network things that you can do? Are there directories that you can join? Are there, do you have thoughts about your area of expertise that you can simply publish? You know, and LinkedIn makes it really easy for people to do that in terms of articles and things like that. Um, If comfortable, would you do videos with, you know, bookkeeping and tax planning tips, things like that? Publish one sheeters that you can email to potential people say, you know, you know, I heard about your business and I heard that you're growing and this is what I offer and here's a one sheeter. So I think that low interaction marketing that doesn't require sort of door to door being out there and network um, networking events is really possible. And again, that goes back to, you know, is your website and your own content 
in order is your LinkedIn profile for yourself and your company in order so that if people meet you in those sorts of environments, they can find you or they can search online and find you really easily there. The key is to drive some demand to you and not have to go out on an individual basis, which is tiring for an introvert and also doesn't scale very well. You know, if we know that 97% of people are searching for goods and products online, and then the key is to really sort of be there too and not have to rely on, on being out so much. So true. And it's quite a staggering number that that are there. So it, it is a massive missed opportunity and, and as a direct line to it is, as you mentioned, Google business, you have free listing, you know, it's uh, something that you, you put on there, people search for bookkeepers near me, your name's going to come up and then Absolutely. they're going to go to your website, right? If you don't have a website though, people would be like, whoa, no website here. What's wrong? <laughs> but, right. And there's really easy templates for free for people to use. And there are self-builders. When I started my business, that's, I mean, it was, that's what I did when it was just me and just built, you know, just to claim my space on the internet so that if I handed someone a business card or if they heard about me and I could say, you know, just go to this website, which is really important. And Google loves when you have a Google My Business listing. And that's where you're actually direct with clients. When you have that profile and you don't have reviews, you need to, you need to ask for a few of those. Mm -hmm. um, so that it just, that's called social proof. And when people are looking for you there, um, just to see that review, if you've been featured in a publication, if you've spoken at an event, those are things that you can list to add social proof to your own sort of credibility and brand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it all starts to add up. And yes. and even it's come up in the podcast before. It's Even if no one ever finds your website, for you to be able to, to send that to a prospective client in, a, in and of itself as an evaluation step for people to know, learn about you, know about you before they meet you, Without it, it really, there is a big missing. If I have a call coming up with somebody and I, I want to know, like, for instance, on this podcast, I, I go to your website, I, I look at it. It's like, it's, it's telling a story that helps me evaluate as, uh, no, obviously I'm, we're not doing a sales transaction or selling services here, but it helps me understand who you are and what you're up to and the things that you are doing. It tells a whole story without that. It's really a, li a limitation, and uh, and so many in this industry have not done that, and and so there is opportunity there. Uh, now, mind you, this industry there are there is a lack of great bookkeepers, and so that's another both pro and con. But being able to get the very best clients, I guess the the thing, Amy, is that I think our listener would be worried, like, oh, geez, I'm already busy, uh, so what do I need a website for? And the thing is, is that you might not have the right clients so that the good clients can't even right. find you. Right? So. right. And to always plan for attrition, you know, we're going into a recession in 2023, potentially, you know, we just don't know. There is some uncertainty in the market. And I think that doing that foundational work for yourself just really sort of adds to the brand uh, and it gives you a fallback, right? So, um, you know, it's a... It's a one-time investment to get that set up and then, up, you know, update as you will, but, and, and update content and, and even consider putting short blog posts on there. It's a very content rich environment, right? If you are advising small businesses on tax planning, on their books, there's a lot you can talk about. We actually um, work with an online bookkeeping service um, as a client, and I've learned a lot <laughs> about tax credits and all the things that they help franchise businesses do. So I, I think there's a lot to talk about and a lot to share in a way that you position yourself as a thought leader. And it doesn't take a whole lot of time. And if you tend to be a bit more introverted, then chances are maybe you like to write. And it doesn't have to be super polished 600 word blogs. It could be a blog page that's really easy to just post, you know, thoughts and a photo and, and things like that. And then people use it to validate you when they're, they're looking. And maybe that's what helps you go up, upstream, helps you command higher fees um, and helps you grow. Yeah. And as you mentioned, it's never been easier to do it To it's, it's as easy as writing in a Word document nowadays, and maybe even easier to to put a website out uh, and, and very inexpensive to do it. Everyone 
should have it. Uh, and hopefully this is, is going to inspire our listener who hasn't looked at that yet or, or our listener that needs to optimize and, and remove what they do have online because many have been in business for a while. Technology has changed. Brands have changed. What you do has changed. It, it does need to be maintained. And, and, and that might be the opportunity is to improve what you're doing and, and push, push out a little further, like you've said, with LinkedIn posts uh, or, or, or getting on social, uh, putting out some blog posts. There's, there's a lot of opportunity there. You, you were in your business, a s- single mother, uh, you went through divorce, you have two uh, children. It's difficult to be a business owner, let alone l- dealing with the life that you have, l- that you're living. What are some tips f- for, from you in order for, to, like, how did you keep it all together and, and still have the, you know, the mindset and the time to grow your business? Well, I thank you for asking that. Um, one thing I, I know that I had to accept was there is a tendency as a working parent or a single working parent to believe that you are falling short in work or with the family. And I had to continue to convince myself that it was good enough what I was doing, that I gave my all to my boys and to the business and tried to create balance and not get into this mindset that somehow I was failing on either end. I was doing both and I was keeping the plate spinning <laughs> and and really just trying to find ways to keep myself healthy and, and not be hard on myself if I had to make sacrifices here and there. Um, I do find that our children love to see us work. I think that they're inspired by it. I think they're curious about it. You know, how many times have we seen attorneys or salespeople or entrepreneurs and their children tend to follow the same path? Um, so I, I think they're inspired by us. And, and so it's why I've built a company that has a culture rooted in kindness and understanding and seeing the whole person because a lot happens in life. And people need the time and the flexibility and the balance so that when they go home at night, they are bringing good things into their family home. And my hope is when our team leaves work in the evenings and they go home, that they are sharing good news about their day. So that culture of kindness and compassion um, is really important and, and really key to who we are as a group. So, so interesting and, and congratulations on navigating through this uh, in your life. And, and I, I agree. I think that's a good parenting advice is that you only can do the best that you can do. And, and uh, I've heard someone say, you're going to mess them up anyway. So <laughs> just do the, nobody gets whether out you of do childhood yeah. unscathed. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> whether you're the best parent or not, they're still going to be messed up and have to figure it out at some point. So um but it can be a lot of stress and anxiety for parents going through it and and trying to grow, grow their business. And Yeah. But you and, know, even when you're busy, and I tell this to our team because we're a distributed team. We have been since 2017. We've never had a central office. I wanted to hire the best people and not be limited by geography. So when COVID happened, that was not a shift for us. It's the way that we had always run the company. And um, I tell them, you know, maybe on a client call, it might be a little different if you're in the middle of a presentation, but please, Take the time when your children come home from school, when they come in, to make sure your face lights up when they come in the room. Because it's those sort of micro interactions with your family, especially when you're working from home, that it's not, I'm on a call, I'll talk to you later, or I'm in the middle of something. It's just to to take those moments to be excited and happy to see them and then explain, you know, sort of what's happening and you can see them in a bit. Um, But I, I think that's, I've always shown tremendous enthusiasm towards my children about spending time with them, even in the midst of sort of all the chaos of growing a company from two to 20 people. So um, I think it's important just to be mindful while we're trying to balance the two that you're not failing on either side and, and to still be excited around your family and partners. So true. So true. Well, Amy, this has been fantastic. I'd love for you to share with our listener, if there were other resources or if they wanted to learn more about you and the services that you offer, what would be the best way for them to do that? 
Sure. Um, so our website is Wild Coffee Marketing. Um, and then you can also find us on all the social channels under Wild Coffee Marketing. And uh, my team that uh, handles content and social, they're incredibly um, bright and funny and interesting. So if you're interested in sort of marketing strategy and trends and um even sometimes memes that are super popular that they share. Um, you can find us on all those channels under Wild Coffee. Beautiful. Well, this has been fantastic. And on behalf of our listener, I'd like to thank you for your generosity and coming on the show and sharing your expertise and your journey. Thank you so much for having me. Pleasure is all ours. And with that, we wrap Another episode of the Successful Bookkeeper Podcast. To learn more about today's wonderful guest and to get access to all sorts of valuable free business building resources, you can go to thesuccessfulbookkeeper.com. Until next time, goodbye. You've been listening to The Successful Bookkeeper with Michael Palmer. For more information and to download the resources mentioned in this episode, please visit us at thesuccessfulbookkeeper.com. Thank you for listening.